Dr. Mary Horgan is with us. She's the president of the RCSI and, uh, and in, um, an expert in infectious diseases and on the GA COVID advisory committee. Dr. Mary Horgan, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well. So um, the last 24 hours, I think, has been very interesting and Im important in terms of how soon we might expect sizable enough crowds back at any kind of outdoor gathering. This has particularly impact on the GA and, of course, the League of Ireland, which we're due back in a couple of weeks as well. Um, can you just update us on what the latest recommendations actually mean on a practical level from a GA perspective? So what they mean is that really nothing has changed from the 200 uh, people out at outdoors events and fi 50 people at indoor events. So obviously the outdoor events are the ones that affect sporting. So it was due to increase up to 500, but now it's still at 200, probably because of the increased uh, number of cases of COVID that we're seeing around the country. N not, not at an alarming rate, but at a rate that we'd like to see a bit more contained. So essentially it would be 200 um, people, and that includes team, backroom staff uh, for any sporting event. And is this all part of phase four? And then so that those dates that we're seeing about the reopening of pubs, that'll be the same time as we go from 200 to 500. They're kind of locked together. Pretty much. Um, I suppose I, I say that the three C's are really important when it comes to control of the virus and um, C, it, it crowds, uh, uh, closed environments and too many contacts. They're, they're the things that we have to avoid. And that's essentially what's happening here. So avoiding any big crowds, even in, in outdoor settings, is really important at the moment. Um What's the difference between 200 and 500 when it comes to that? Is it significant? Is it because like, you kind of think that essentially 200 includes the players and officials, so it's probably about 120 really. The difference between 120 and 500 in the stadium doesn't seem immediately that obvious, but I suspect that they're talking about gigs in smaller areas as well. Is that why? The <laughs> Exactly. You know, it's it's just that the uh, sports grounds will be so variable. You know, you're talking on Croke Park in one end and some small club, we'll say, outside Killy Beggs and the other hand. So it's hard to do bespoke um, crowd sizes. Otherwise, it gets really, really complicated. So it's a blanket 200 for, uh, throughout the country, irrespective of the size of the facilities. Um, and I think this this is the, you know, obviously, you know, we, the GAA have been um, adamant and rightly so in absolutely following the public health guidance. And this is currently the guidance. So while 200 is small, look, it's better than, than where we were um, two months ago when we didn't even think that there would be uh, contact sports uh, up and running. So, you know, yeah, a, a bit, a bit um, you know, I won't say bad news, but trying to control things, but much better than it was a few months back. You said that the GEA have been very good at, at following the, the national health, health advice, and, and rightly so. Like some might say that they've even been more cautious than the national health advice when the phases started to go. The GEA were a couple of weeks behind in terms of putting people back onto the pitch. And of course, the, the health advice was there and being uber cautious is never the bad thing to do. But when it comes to crowds coming back, they've possibly gone the other way on it a little bit, that they are going to be the first sporting organisation in this country to have spectators at a sport, despite the fact that there are so many mini factions, so many small club grounds around the country that are going to be hosting these games. Uh, was that a concern at all, that perhaps there were too many variables or, or a lot of variables, at least when it comes to putting 200 people into different scenarios around the country? Yeah, well, uh, just to go back to the public health uh, guidance, um, the as you'll recall, uh, the contact sports weren't supposed to start until the 20th of July, and then the government announced in, in mid-June that it would actually be the 29th of June. And uh, the GA really have been leading the way in return to sports. And we all know the importance of sports for health and well-being. I mean, I see it all the time as a doctor, um, how really important it is for, uh, for all ages. And that includes spectators enjoying um, pe talented people playing sport. Have they gone the other way? We, we have to start somewhere. We have to have a plan. Um, COVID, it looks like, will be with us for a while. So we need to do that <clears throat> phased uh, return to play, and that includes bringing spe spectators in. And, you know, I'm not a sports ex um, expert. I enjoy watching um, sports, uh, particularly GA as a Kerry woman. Um, 
but if if it's about 120 spectators, most um, uh, uh, stadia around the country will be able to facilitate that. And, you know, it does come down to personal responsibility of the spectators that have come. Everything that we do at the present time impacts um, on others. So that self-responsibility of, you know, washing your hands, cough etiquette, um, you know, is, is so important so that even when you come onto the ground, if you're one of the privileged few, I would say, to watch a match, um, first of all, you're privileged. Secondly, you know, do the public health guideline uh, guidance. We, we hear them every day on the radio and TV um, and really enjoy it. But we have to start somewhere. We can't be in, in a state of, you know, suspended animation. Um, we, we do need to get the country up and running again with, with public health guidance, really keeping a sharp eye on the numbers of, of uh, those infected around the country. That's the tension at the middle of everything at the moment, isn't it? Where we need to somehow find out what the, the next phase of our normal is going to be. And the only way to get there involves a little bit of risk. Because there was a great piece in the, in the Examiner yesterday from Michael Moynihan, where he had one line which really stuck out when you read it, was the irony which no one seems to want to articulate is that an organisation which was front and centre in aiding communities through the lockdown has the potential to revive the virus. That's true, but at the same time, they also have the potential to be the engine through which we learn more about, uh, actually 200 is fine, then it's like 500 is okay, but there will be cases if people are, are not taking personal responsibility. And if, if no one steps forward to be that agent of change, then we're stuck. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we cannot live in fear all of the time, particularly um, when in the absence of a vaccine, it looks like this is going to be, be with us for a time. So like everything in life, uh, there's risks and benefits to everything. And uh, the risk um, of getting the virus is still low or, and certainly bad effects from it in younger people who, who play sports is low. It's not zero, but anything in life that we do, driving a car, going to work, they all have risks. And we could just sit back and do nothing and have people not playing sports anymore. That would not be a good thing. Um, so, you know, these are baby steps, but they need to be taken and somebody needs to be brave enough to do it. But with a reminder again that these are all in line with the public health guidance um, from the HS, um, HSE and the HPSC from whom we get the guidance. So I think it's important we have to start somewhere and it's always good to plan. Um, the plan may change, but people need plans. I see the other side of this tension too. For the, the um, Glanworth were one of the GA clubs um, who have had a, a positive case. And you can see if you're a, a part of an organisation which is an amateur community-based grassroots organisation like a GA club in a, a small part of the country um, where somebody gets it, you're suddenly terrified that that might lead to a fatality. And, and the, the um, examiner the day before had this story where Liam Brennan, the club chairman, was, was terrified that there might be somebody who ends up having a positive case that leads to a fatality and he, he fears that that's going to shut down all of the GA. And I can see how if you're in a club where you've had a case you would be terrified that suddenly it's going to end up perpetually being associated with something that happened in the area. But that comes back to your point about living in fear, I suspect. Um, yes, it does. And I think it's important to reiterate that I would your chances of getting um, an infection on the field of play in an outdoor activity is going to be low. Again, it's not zero. Most people who get infections, it's, it's off the field of play. And I suppose we do have other sporting um, authorities internationally who are back in play. And of course, I can appreciate people's fear of being responsible for um, passing on infections. But again, that comes back to personal responsibility, not attending training or indeed um, watching a game. If you've got any symptoms at all, you go, you contact your doctor, public health will follow up with uh, testing and tracing. But I, I, what's, what's happening here is baby steps, and the GA have been brave enough to start the baby uh, steps, but with close monitoring of um, what's going on nationally. And again, always um, in line with public health uh, guidance. 
otherwise we would not be do, you know playing any sport for the next year if we didn't do um take those baby uh, baby steps and in fairness they have spent a huge amount ga the organization has spent a huge amount of time um trying to get this um as right as possible with the um safety of players backroom staff and now spectators being paramount. Can I ask you just one, one aspect of, of that monitoring um, to, to finish this up? We had um, Kieran Donaghy on the show, obviously, you'd be familiar with, the, with uh, yep. Kieran's genius, and he was saying that in Austin Stacks, they've gone and they've, they've bought a, a thermometer so that they're actually gonna check the temperatures of people, and I think that ended up being an important bit in Glamworth as well, where um, we're not quite sure of the order, but certainly a temperature was taken, it was found to be high, and the player uh, was feeling unwell. I don't know if the feeling unwell precipitated the temperature check or if the temperature check was like, actually, I'm not feeling well and my temperature's high. So it, it, it turns out that is important. Um, the GA made the decision not to supply the clubs with a thermometer. Um, I think, uh, I, the, I'll just read the exact quote. On, our stance on temperature checking was reached after medical advice from our advisory committee and their thinking centred on whether you would want a child or adult with a temperature possibly unbeknownst to themselves, standing in a line with others waiting to have their temperature checked. This was not deemed good practice and it was felt wiser and safer to have this practice completed at home if a test was deemed necessary. Um, is that, is that? Yeah, yeah, so, so most people when they have temperatures, they feel unwell. And the advice from the GA clearly is, if you are unwell uh, for any reason, you should not attend training. Um, the temperature checks have limited use and using them widespread is, I don't think, uh, the best practice. I think the onus again is on self-responsibility uh, for either a parent who, who, who has a child who, who's going out to train or indeed the players, um, the older players that their responsibility is if you feel unwell at all, as you, I don't know the this situation with Glanworth, but it sounds that that player was unwell anyway. And if you're unwell, stay at home, get your temperature checked and follow up with your doctor. Um, the logistics of doing temperature checks all over the country is just not feasible. Um, and again, it's it's the, oh, the self-responsibility. If you're sick at all, if you're feeling unwell, get your temperature check and, and um, get on to your GP. Sorry, Arne, I don't know if you had one there. Yeah, like, just, just could you explain just how out of reach that that prospect is? I, I appreciate that trying to get into the minutiae of every club getting a thermometer could be tough. Like, had you considered that at all? Because for me, when I think about it, if, if I'm a player who's got a county final at the weekend and I have a temperature, there is an incentive there to not tell the authorities about my temperature, especially if I'm not going to be checked for it. Yeah, well, you can take, you know, people can get rid of their temperatures very easily by taking medications. So, again, it's not something that you police. It comes back to um, self-responsibility. And a lot of the uh, temperature checks are not, you know, wh while, while they're available at airports and all that, it doesn't mean that you may not have a temperature or you may not admit to having a temperature. And the organization, and I, I believe rightly so, based on, on, on the science, is that really the onus is on players and parents and spectators to check themselves before they go out. And if they're unwell, and, and sometimes you can feel unwell without even having, having a temperature. Sometimes people take two Panadol, temperature goes, um, and they still have an issue. So it comes back again to, you know, if you feel unwell at all, do not do not um, attend any um, games because the impact you have on others is, is huge in that instance. The, the, the general mood when something like um, a phase being kicked back, it, it's, it's definitely a, ooh, uh, what's going to happen here? And, and certainly speaking to people who are connected to various teams around the country over the last while, and, and we all have been doing here at, uh, at OTB, there's a a growing, I don't want to say pessimism, but there's a fear that maybe the season won't be as straightforward as the, the map is there, we're going to have county finals, we're going to have a return to play in September, and then we're going to have, sorry, a return to training in September for inter inter-county teams, and then come October, we'll have matches and the All-Ireland final is going to happen, and it's all going to be plain sailing and straightforward. We may even have 5,000 at an All-Ireland final or 10,000 at an All-Ireland final. What's your gut instinct at the moment about where we're going to be? Some people are saying it's 50-50 whether or not we do have an inter-county season at the moment. 
I think it's impossible to tell. Everything about this virus has been unpredictable. And um, as I said earlier on, it's important to have a plan, but the plan may change. And really, um, and, and that's why close alignment with public health guidance is essential. Look, I, I think we're, as I said, in a better place now than we were in a few months ago. The roadmap can change and people need to understand that. Um, is it you know, am I pessimistic about how the season is going to to proceed? No, I think the the fact that we're actually um, getting back to play is a huge bonus. How the you know club versus intercounty will play out in the next few months is absolutely impossible to tell. But you know, at least we're in the start of the path, and um, hopefully it'll continue. And if an intercounty team gets a positive case in the middle of a week of a match, does that mean that that team ends up ultimately not playing or does that then come down to the contact tracing and the quality of the contact tracing is going to be hugely important? Absolutely. It, that, that is key. I mean, the contact tracing that public health do is uh, really important. They're experts in the area. It's, apt, it's totally up to them um, how they call on what players can play or whose close contacts versus casual contacts. And that's uh, the, all the remit in the remit of public health uh, within the country. They're the experts uh, and we absolutely need to follow their guidance. Dr. Mary Horgan, thanks so much for joining us this morning. That's very clear.